Good morning. Glad that you all are here this morning. My name is Pastor Duba. I'm uh, glad that you've chosen to join us for worship. Uh, as we going to get started with some songs in just a minute, hopefully you were able to grab a worship guide or a bulletin as you came in. Uh, a couple things I want to just point out. Uh, if you work with children in any way, or if you would like to work with children in any way, uh, we do have a children's ministry meeting after the service today. There is free lunch there for you, so you should definitely come. Some of you were wondering if you might, God might be calling you to children's ministry. There's free lunch, so he is. Uh, also, after, after, the, after the time there of, uh, of talking about children's ministry and policy and procedure stuff, if you would like to participate in uh, the kids' camp or VBS this summer, uh, which is also part of children's ministry, so you'll need to be there for the first part where there's food, but then stick around afterwards, and we'll talk about what's happening there uh, in the life of what's going to happen with VBS. You see that in your bulletin. Also, Adult Plus lunch, uh, and then next week as well, uh, there will be, and you'll notice this as you're leaving next week, uh, the youth will be having a bake sale, I'm told. Is that still happening? Yes. So you'll be able to spend some money and it, it supports some youth to go to camp in, uh, in June. One other thing I want to let you know about that many of you have asked about is a service for Kay Bazell, who passed away recently, went home to be with the Lord. Um, I just heard this morning as far as when the service will be. It will be here. It'll be at 11 o'clock on June 4th. So that's a Saturday at 11 o'clock, and then there will be food afterwards as well. If you'd like to help uh, bring food in any way, uh, let me know, and we can coordinate that as well. But June 4th at 11 o'clock for Kay Bazell, if you'd like to be a, a part of that. I'm going to read a passage from Ephesians chapter 4, and then we'll uh, open in prayer. It says this, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that you belong and have been called. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have called us into your family. Thank you that we can be a part of your family and experience the blessing of that as we worship you this morning. Help us to remember the hope that we have in you. The joy that we can have because of that hope, remembering that eternity is ours because of you, that we can rejoice in that future. No matter what's going on in our life today, Lord, help us to remember that you are with us and you have not left us and that we have people around us to help us in this journey of life that you've put us in and your spirit to guide and direct us. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand and sing.
Today it's called Only a Holy God. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every
to the holy of holy into the place where kings take off their crown we're overwhelmed by the weight of your glory you're lifted higher and
join with the angels, we'll join with the saints, we'll lift up your praise as we lift up your name. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We're singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Children ages three to five, you are gone. All right. Don't have to wait too long. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 today as we move forward with our theme of imperfect church, perfect gospel. That doesn't apply to us, does it? I'm just, just checking it. How we, how we look at ourselves. Yes, we are imperfect, aren't we? And yes, we need this, this section of Scripture. All of Scripture. Um, let's pray before we, we begin. Lord, you are a, an awesome God, a holy God to be worshipped at all times and all situations. And Lord, Thank you for this time now that we have had, what a blessing it has been to to sing praises to your holy name, to acknowledge you as our God, our creator, and our savior. And Lord, now we get to read your word together. Lord, we know that we're going to be blessed because your word is alive. Lord, it encourages us, it teaches us, it corrects us, Lord, that we can leave today to worship you even better than when we came today. Lord, that you would be glorified. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First, First Corinthians chapter 7, seven short verses here, 17 through 24. We'll read them and then we will talk about them for a few minutes. Paul says this, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. That is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord, Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let, or there, let him remain with God. So what is our, our role in today's social climate? Are we accepting our role? Are we trying to reverse our role? Are we trying to change our role? As that title said, we can spend hours watching the news and and it can realize that the world we live in is not not the best, is it? We get angry, we get frustrated, we want to just shut the TV off. We say, why do I even turn on the news? All I do is get frustrated, angry, and want to put my fist through it. All right, because it it just makes me mad and angry. In fact, I think, you know, as I stated here, that you know, CNN could stand for, this time, Corinthian News Network. Because the thing that we're watching today was the same thing that was going on 2,000 years ago in the world. Nothing really has changed as far as how man sins. Just now we see it 24-7 on the news cycle, and it's even more frustrating. 
But the question is, how are we the church supposed to live each and every day while we live in this world? Because we are here whether we like it or not. As much as we complain about it and much as we get angry about it, we wake up the next morning and we are still here. So we might as well live in a way while we're here that's going to bring glory to God, right? Because in the end, what else matters? That God receive the glory. So how are we to do that? And just, this may be the shortest message ever, all right, because it's really simple. The first point is that while we are here, and we, I got this from, from the book we did in our gospel communities as far as the gospel and life, and, and the author starts off with this, this passage on how the Israelites lived, and it doesn't really change for us today. In Jeremiah chapter 29 is that we need to be avoid, or avoid being preoccupied with external factors. Think about that. How much energy, how much angst and worry and stress do we get by worrying how we can change the world we live in externally? We think we can do it, but has it ever happened? It's the same world, isn't it? Same world as it was 2,000 years ago in Corinth. The same factors that are causing division that we've been talking about because the unity of the church was being compromised by people with all these different opinions and preferences and how they think the best life should be lived. Whether it be, as we talked about, being married or unmarried, promoting celibacy or promoting the family, which was better. And that was like coming into the church saying, look at me, I'm, I'm celibate, I'm the best here. I should be doing this, I should be doing that because I live this way. Or the other way that, no, you need to be married. The fact is that people were, were taking sides and there was going to division being taking place in the church. And today we look at something different as far as where you were called. And we think that we can make it better or the world can be better, but we get be preoccupied with it and we get so much that we forget about why we are here. We're so worried about change in the world politically or socially that we forget about the world being changed by new hearts. And as God told the Israelites going into, of all places, Babylon, not the, not the most God-friendly place on the face of the earth at the time, was it? The man, Nebuchadnezzar, or Zer, I mean, the men that led Babylon, they were, they were tyrants. It was a pagan world that worshipped the leaders, that worshipped the things of the world and had nothing to do with God. But this is God's advice accounted to them as they go into this land, that they're going to be exiled for their own failings and their own worshipping of other idols and gods. He was was disciplining them, but he says this in verse 4 of chapter 29, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. He didn't say run and hide and bury your heads for 40 years. Like the the prophets told them that could happen to to go outside the walls, camp there, then go in what you need and partake of what you need and then come back out because it's going to be a short time. God says, go there and live. Go there and walk your life. Go there and honor me as you produce and you multiply your families and keep my name holy. And even today, you know, that's, that's an amazing way to live. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But we know that Throughout even our our church history in the United States, there's been lots of conversations about our responsibility as a church and what we are to do about the state of the affairs of our country. 
What do we do to change this country? What do we object to? What do we not support? Where do we not go because we want to not agree with what is going on in that, in that business or what have you? Who can we elect? What, what person can we have to, to make things better for us in our country so that we can live our life the way we want to live our life without too much persecution or pushback? How much are we to be involved? Are we to be Christian activists who fight or to litigate for laws that agree with our beliefs? Is that why we're here, just to be the greatest litigators on the face of the earth? Are we here to be mighty Christian activists to help change the laws that will make life better for us that are here? Do we think that we can get the, the, the best political party in charge, then everything's going to be okay? Then I can go along, live my life, go to church, talk about Jesus, and, and not be persecuted or be harmed for doing so. For a lot of us, I think that would be great, wouldn't it? But is that what God called us to? We know that all forms of human government are imperfect. So why do we think that if we put another human in government, that's going to be even better? It's not perfect. Even though God establishes the authorities and the governments, they're there for his purpose. It doesn't mean that they are perfect. So how do we live while we are here? How do we live in a culture that we all know is, is on the outside getting further and further and further away from the biblical values we hold? How do we exist in such an environment? And there's three ways that we can do this. This is a freebie. It's not in your outline, so... You can turn it over. It will be up here on the PowerPoint. But there's three ways that we can respond to the culture we live in. We can be offended. And when you're offended with something, what do you do? You run and you hide and you don't touch it because it's going to contaminate me. We judge it. We put it down. We make it look bad or we talk about it because it offends us. And if we're going to build a bridge and, and, and proclaim the gospel with somebody, we, have to, we, we can't do that. We can't be offended. The second way that we respond to culture, which is what we see and what's happened with the church today, is that we can assimilate and incorporate some of the culture into our church so that we can be more like it and maybe reach more people. But we know that it really doesn't work, does it? The third way that we, and I think this is the best way, and I think this is what Paul is saying here as we look at this, is that we can engage. We want to build bridges into this culture so that we can walk across that bridge and engage with culture. And why do we want to engage with them? Because we love them and we want them to see and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If we're offended, that's not going to happen. If we assimilate, they're saying, well, you're just like us, so why do we need Jesus? But if we love them and engage with culture and where we're at, we have opportunities to proclaim truth to them. The truth that this world is desperately seeking and a hope. And I think that's Paul is teaching as far as the unity is that it doesn't matter where you are at. The main principle is repeated here and it's three times in these three verses is that Christians should willingly accept, which means to consent to receive, the situation into which God has placed them, and to be content, which means content, a state of peaceful happiness, to serve him right where you are at. And right where the world is at. I mean, we're not called to praise and worship God when things are perfect, are we? We're not called to worship and praise God only when we have a job, are we? We're not called to praise and worship God only when things are going our way in life. We are called to worship God in all situations, in all ways and points in life. 
to serve him right where you are at. And you may ask yourself, well, why did God put me here? Because he knew that you were at the best place you are now to be a missionary for Jesus Christ. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to move. You don't have to make more money. You don't have to be freer, as we're going to see. You don't have to be a certain nationality or race. You don't have to have that right job. You can be unemployed. You can even be homeless and worship God. But sometimes we wait for that perfect circumstance to be happy or to be joyful or to be content. Christianity has a long history of engaging when things go bad. There's a couple of quotes as we were in our gospel communities reading through this and how we are to, to live as Christians and, and what that looks like. Um, this is a quote from the Roman Emperor Julian around 360 AD. He says this, The impious Galileans, the Christians, support not only their poor, but ours as well. Everyone can see that our people lack aid from us. So in the midst of that time frame where, you know, things weren't always best for the Christians, they were still showing the love for the world around them. They weren't offended. They weren't assimilating. They were different, and they were engaging in times that need to be engaged. Dionysius, the bishop of Alexandria, says this around 260 A.D., This is during the great epidemic. Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. Many, in nursing and curing others, transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. The pagans behaved in the very opposite way. At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled even from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead. How are we to engage with our culture and society? They may not be dying of a, of a physical disease, but our world is dying of a spiritual disease, and what are we doing about it? Are we offended by that spiritual disease and say, ah, no, I can't interact with you because you do this, 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 or this? Are we trying to engage with people who are spiritually dying and showing them that there's a way for hope and life in Jesus Christ? Did Christ come as an activist? Did Christ come demanding Herod change his laws to better suit the Israelites or what his worldview was like? To favor the new kingdom? The Jews wanted a Messiah to come and change everything, but what they got was a Messiah whose kingdom was not of this world. He tells us this in in John 18 as he was before Herod. He says, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. And they probably would have won. That's Jesus, okay? That I that I I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world, is it? We are citizens of the kingdom of Jesus. We are exiles in this land for a very short time. 70, 80 years. Kind of double of what the Jews were in in Babylon. We're here. We're sojourners. This isn't our permanent residence. We don't want this world to be better, do we? Because we're living for another kingdom. We want the kingdom to grow. We want more people to join us in that kingdom but we're never going to change and make this world any better. 
It may happen, and our communities may be better as, as, as Babylon prospered, as we grow and we multiply as a church and we have influence in other areas. Of, it, it's going to be better for a while, but in the end, this is not our permanent home, is it? Our permanent residence is in the kingdom of God. And so Jesus came as he stood before Herod, not to change politically or the, the standards of living there, but he tells us in Luke 19, says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That was his only purpose of coming. And if we're to be imitators of Jesus Christ while we're here, then our role as Christians is to do the same thing, to seek and to save the lost through the proclamation of the only thing that can save them, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So instead of having a radical agenda that's going to try and change the political landscape of this country, let's proclaim a gospel that is going to radically change the hearts of men. And then we will see a change in our culture, won't we? We can't change the culture first without changing the hearts of men. And the hearts of men can only be changed by God and by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's have a mindset of engagement, a love for humanity that is desperate in desperate need of a Savior. And we all know as the heart of man is changed, so goes the climate of the people that we live around. That's even in our own family, isn't it? How many times do you go to Thanksgiving where you sit across with people who don't know Jesus or even hate God, and how peaceful is that dinner? I mean, it can be. But the peace only comes through Jesus Christ. And engagement in our culture is exactly where God has called you. At this point in life. And, and Paul gives us two areas in which this applied to the Corinthians. Of course, it's like, well, what does that mean for us today? But culturally, in the context of that time, this was everything. And we can relate it to today as well. Let's look at the first one in verse, verses 17 through 19. And this next point is serve the Lord where you were called. Pretty basic, isn't it? Where you were called. Where God saved you, serve there. And yes, we have all have another calling. Some of us are called into ministry. But, but if, if God doesn't call you into ministry, and, and, and if everyone was called into church ministry, and we all spent you know, 40 hours a week here on this premises, then who's out there in the world showing Jesus Christ to the people? Does that make sense? We need to be rubbing elbows with our neighbors. We need to be rubbing elbows, engaged with the people who need to see Jesus Christ. So Paul says this, 17, Only let each person lead the life the Lord has assigned. It's given to you. God has given you that life. Did he make a mistake in the life that you have right now? Now, we make choices, right? And sometimes we make bad choices. And those bad choices may put us in a different state of life. Can God still use you in that state of life? Amen. Yes, he can. Does it matter how big the mistake was? No. God can use you anywhere. Because he has assigned you that place. And we know God doesn't make mistakes. Now, of course, if God has called you to be a drug trafficker, don't be content there. <laughs> right? If it's immoral, you need to change. And God is going to change you and give you a heart to get out of that lifestyle. So don't be content, of course. And, that, and Paul's not saying that. The idea that Paul is saying is that we are to accept and to be content in the social conditions and situations that we are saved in. He didn't call you to be a political activist. He called you to be a light bearer. He called you to be a salt of the earth. 
He called you to be ambassador for Jesus Christ. So if you want to get political, it's about as political as I want to get, is that just be an ambassador. Just go and represent Jesus Christ wherever you are at. Whatever demographic, whatever social economic level that you're at, be an ambassador of Jesus Christ right there. And be content. And if God wants to move you someplace else, he wants to move you up on that ladder, he's going to do that. Why? Because he has a plan for you on that, that stratus level. But don't be ashamed of where you're at right now. If it's not immoral and you're honoring God, serve him there and be content. The unity in Corinth was being fractured by factions of people telling others that they have to be, you know, to get married or they have to be celibate. All these things, they have to be slaves or you're discontent as a slave. I'm a freed man. I'm better than you. All these things were just causing factions and, and disunity within the church. How many times have you seen Facebook or Twitter blow up over opinions and views expressed? And yes, even in the church, it happens, doesn't it? Think about it. Can a Christian still be a Christian in a dictatorship? Does that dictator strip him away of his identity in Christ? No. No. Can he still be a Christian in a democracy? Of course. We kind of live in there now. Can a Christian be a Christian in anarchy? Complete anarchy. Does that keep you from being a Christian? Your identity is still in Christ, isn't it? Can anything take away that identity? Can any administration take away your identity? Can any job status take away your identity? Our identity is in Jesus Christ, and that is forever. Does our gender or marital status keep us from serving Christ? No. Does our nationality? What if you were a slave? And how appalling it is to have ownership, and we know that, but growing up, if you were up here in this stadium, and I, I brought Josh up here, and I sold him to, well, not Paul, he's already said, but I sold him to Gerald for $500. That's a pretty good price, all right? Does that strip away Josh's identity as a Christian? No. Can he still love and worship God? Yes. But these were teachings and ideas that were causing disharmony within the church. What can really separate us from the love of God anyway? What can keep us from loving God? Just ourselves. He goes on. Was anyone at that time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at that time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision. But what really counts, no matter what, is keeping the commandments of God. So again, we're looking at context and culture here. We got, we got Jews who were dispersed through all this land. They were becoming Christians. They were converting from Judaism to Christianity. They were Jews, and they were living in the Roman culture. It really wasn't cool to be a Jew in the Roman culture. And you have Jews and Romans together coming to worship, and there's probably some like comparison, like, well, I wish I was a Roman. I wish I wasn't circumcised. So Paul is addressing this nationality here. It wasn't a benefit to be a Jew. In fact, it was quite an embarrassment to be circumcised. So imagine the discontent of this, working out in the local gymnasium or going to a public bath as a Jew. It's pretty obvious that you were a Jew. They didn't wear clothes in the gymnasium. They didn't wear clothes in the public bath. So there was, in fact, that men were even wanting to like reverse their circumcision because they wanted to look like the Romans. It was to their benefit. And that was being 
talked about in the church, and it was probably being lorded over, and it was comparisons because of the fact that I'm a Roman, I'm better than you. And it could have been the other way around, where, you know, it's better to be circumcised. It went either way. But the fact is, men, they were so distracted by this, they were trying to reverse it, but they were so distracted that they couldn't think about what was truly important, and that was the gospel. And we do the same thing. We get so distracted about social norms and social things going on in our country that we, we just lose focus. Now, I'll confess, I can spend more time reading news than I can reading my Bible. Why? Because it just it kind of intrigues me and it gets me angry for some reason. It just kind of feeds it, and I don't know why we do that. But it's a distraction. Only if it was better. Only if this was happening. Only if gas was only a dollar a gallon. Can we still be a Christian at six bucks a gallon? (laughs) We may say some words and we got to confess that, right? We're not losing our Christianity. We get angry, but we're still the same person, aren't we? It doesn't matter. There's still lost people in this world. The only mark that we need to be worried about is the mark of a circumcised heart, though. That is humble and ready to serve our risen Savior, a heart that is obedient to God. That's the only circumcision that we're worried about, is a heart that truly loves Jesus Christ. Third point. Just like the second point, serve the Lord where you're called. Not a whole lot of creativity here. But it's, he just, Paul is just, again, stating the same point, but in a different context. He says here, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. It doesn't change. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Of course, if you have the opportunity, be a free man. But while you're a slave, still love Jesus and serve him as you were a free man. Because in reality, aren't we all free in Christ? But a bondservant, it's kind of like, you know, that paradox. But it's okay. Isn't it better to be a slave to Christ than a slave to man? Who's a better master? Jesus is. Again, it's another encouragement to be content in the condition which you were called. Whether it be racial, like we just talked about, or in these verses, a social distinction between people. And it was a huge one. Our focus should not be on this temporal, natural world that will one day pass, but instead a supernatural kingdom that Jesus is reigning over today. The kingdom that we truly are citizens of. And you're a citizen whether they were a free man or a slave. He's not approving slavery or saying that it is better to be free. What he is saying is that you can still be a servant of Jesus Christ whether you are free or a slave. He even says this in Ephesians chapter 6 as he talks to the people in Ephesus. He says, bond servants... So obviously there were servants there as well in Ephesus. It says, Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or he is free. So he's not proposing any one or the other. It's just the fact of the reality of the culture at that time that 50% of the people were slaves. So we cut this room in half. And, like, and you know, I don't know if all the you know, slave owners sat over here, then all the slaves sat over here. I mean, there was issues of that as well. But we are all one in the, in the body of Christ. But there was an issue where slaves are wanting to be free and, and wanting to be away from the bond service. And Paul says, no, obey them. And they, they weren't always good. And the, bond, and the servants at that time, it could, be, it could be a lawyer, it could be a teacher, it could be a, a doctor. They were all servants. They were all owned by other people. 
And those masters could have been nice, or they could not have been nice. He didn't make that distinction. He said to be content there. For he who has called, who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. And that's our reminder. And as, as Paul emphasized in, in, ver, or in Ephesians, is that we, we work for Christ anyway. Be content where you are because the work that you are doing, you're doing it as you're working for the Lord. Now, I don't know how that works if you're self-employed. <laughs> Never been there. But in reality, we're all, we're all slaves. I mean, we got to work, don't we? And if you work for somebody, yeah, you have the freedom to go somewhere else and quit your job, but you also have a family to take care of. So in a way, we're kind of like enslaved to that position, aren't we? And we can all complain about our employers. Some are better than others. And if you are an employer, I pray to God that you're a good employer. You take care of your people. I'm sure you do. And the better you do that, the better they're going to work for you. It's a, it's a great cyclical thing. And then he goes on to say, Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. So not to be for the, the masters to be all you know, gloating and, and, and thinking they're superior, we're still bondservants. We still serve a risen Savior together. We serve a master. We serve Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and our Savior. Why? Because you were bought with a price. Jesus owned you. And that, that just goes against all of culture anyway, right? Nobody likes to be owned or told or be accountable. But in fact, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we do that because he bought us. He purchased us with his blood. That's okay. You were bought with a price. And because of that, don't become a bondservant of men. Don't be men pleasers. Again, the third time the principle is stated in verse 24. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Be content there. Accept the fact of where you're at. And if God willing, God wants you to, either way, I've known men where God has taken everything away from them. And they could still serve God. A man who I just, just going to hire a guy at school, and, and he was, you know, got his master's in divinity, smart young man, and, and he was in service, and the, the church disbanded, and he felt himself unemployed, and he came, and, and God called him to the school, and is like, be content there, and he is. So it goes in both directions. Just one question. What in this world can keep you from faithfully serving Jesus Christ? What, is, what in this world can keep you from faithfully serving Jesus Christ? If it's not a president or a tyrant or both, if it's not conditions in life, job or no job or where you're at, what can really keep us from serving Jesus Christ faithfully? Selves. Which comes down to what? Sin? Yeah. It doesn't matter where you're at. Nothing can keep us from faithfully serving Jesus Christ unless it's ourselves. We, usually it's pride which is just sin anyway, right? It comes down to that. So, with that, and as Pastor Duba read at the beginning of the service, different but very similar in the context, Paul encourages the people of Ephesus to, to walk in a manner worthy of the call. You were called to a life in Jesus Christ. And this call is the call to salvation. This is the call that was provided to you by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, 
that he would give you the faith to believe that you needed forgiveness of sins and you asked Jesus Christ to do that. And he's telling these people here, because of that call, because of what God has done for you by his grace, that we are to walk, to respond, to walk, to live, which is what it means, basically live each day, live in a way that gives glory to God. He says this to them, Therefore, himself a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called to. How? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He's talking to us, isn't he? The church. That we are to walk together in such a manner. And when we walk together in such a manner, then we become a light into this world. a testimony of God's greatness to the people who are watching us. And it doesn't matter, they go together, it doesn't matter what state of life you're in, that we are to do this as perfect as we can as a body of Christ. We fail, but we press on to this likeness of being humble and being gentle and patient as Christ is with each other. The family here, your family, because that just cries out the beauty and the love of Jesus Christ, which we are called to do. Let's pray. Lord God, tough, tough words, Lord. As we are impatient, we are opinionated, we have preferences, we have desires, Lord, but I pray that our desires would be your desires. Lord, when our heart is melted and conforming to your heart, that you will give us the desires of our heart. Lord, help us to love you more and more each and every day, to be humble, to be patient, to be content and to know that you are in control, that we would put all of our faith and trust in you and not ourselves. Lord, that a world would see that and have the same hope and a Savior that provides eternal life. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together and, and sing a, a closing song or just one song. And if you want to pray, Pastor Duba will be up here as myself, and uh, we would love to pray with you about anything. But let's sing together. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior And life more abundant and free Through death into life everlasting We pass and we fall
shall not fail you. He promised, believe it, and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, His perfect salvation. One way or the other, we got two songs in there I today. When you said that. <laughs> All right. Don't forget um, those who want to be involved in children's ministry. Uh, knowing Judith, she's planned a certain amount of food. 
but surprise her and there won't be enough because more people want it. Is that, is that okay, Judith? Yeah, just come back and join us if you want to be involved in children's ministries or VBS later on this summer. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, you are, <laughs> you are so good and so worthy of all that we have done today. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for choosing us to be your children. Lord, I pray as we leave today that we would leave encouraged, equipped, Lord, to do the good works that you've called us to do. Lord, to be a living sacrifice, Lord, to love you and to love the world that you have planted us in. That you would be glorified through your kingdom growing, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.